But all the children that tune in from around the world, you know, Lenny asks always the first question, because this is a music show and it's very important we get this, mm-hmm. is Lee, what is your first encounter? Or should I say, when was your first encounter with music? You know? Wow, that's an interesting one. Um, ooh, I had I have many stages of my life. My life is like a, a book of forge main books in itself. Um, when I was very young, I played violin in school and I played the big recorder. I think a lot of people did um, when they were in primary school, lower school here in the UK. And um, my parents split up and I, my father sold a house in London because I was born in Hackney in London, not far from, I think, where Norma Jay was uh, actually. Um, and then I went for a brief period and lived in New York. And my first encounter there with music was uh, my father's wife took me to an audition at Worldwide Records. I was about maybe 11 or something like that. And they liked my voice. And uh, I did a few demos, um, which I won't even tell you what they were. Wait a minute, in New Uh, York? This was in New York. I didn't know anything about this part. I lived lived in East 95th Street between... Um, East New York Avenue and Rutland Road. I went to St. Francis of Assisi School. Later on, um, before I went back to come back to England, I went to Bishop Lockton Memorial High School. I did track. This was a very short period of time, but it was extremely influential. It was, uh, it was the mid seventies where there was so much change going on, especially when it came to people on TV. The Flip Wilson Show, Diane Carroll, um, Bill Cosby. Um, you know, I remember the Melbourne, I mean, I met Melbourne Moore, became good friends with her, but I remember seeing her show she had with Cleve, uh, Cleveland, Cleveland, Cl- was it Clifford? Isn't it Clifford something? Is it? Yes. He, he, he wrote they, were Never they, they were this black yeah, person. That's, that's, yeah. sure, that's right. And he wrote Clifton, Never Can Say Goodbye. Clifton, and, uh, something. Clifton, uh, Clifton was it? Clifton. Oh God, it's gonna get me well, now. Well, help me out there. Who who remembers the show of Melbourne Moore, nineteen seventy one? That where she yeah, it was a around, them. yeah, and yeah, it was, um, right. They were known as the first Sunny and Cher. Yeah, it was in the summer season. They were giving a lot of the black folks summer shows. Like the Jacksons had a summer show. Gladys Knight had a summer show. Um, and uh, if you were lucky to see them, you know, at that time, it was very, very, you know. But I, I soaked all of that up. I was very much. Um, and I still, I might still be the person that would, I'd read all the, every, who, who did the background vocals, who did the arrangements, who did the, the played bass, who played, you know, and um, it, when I was in New York, there was such a wide, diverse um, sense of music that just inspired me. And I remember, um, this, how, this is how diverse it was, that um, Eddie Kendrick's My People Hold On album came out at the time. And um, a friend of mine said, you've got to hear this track. This is really something. And we were in school, you know, in school. And it was going into the change of mind. And that's been like the epitaph of my life. I, I, that, that, you know, going into the change of mind, you know, anytime I get a chance to play that, if I'm doing a DJ set or something, that is it. And at the same time, I got into jazz and blues because um, a, a film came out by the name of Lady Sings the Blues. And... It was really weird because I knew Motown and I knew the Supremes, but I didn't know Diana Ross. That was kind of weird. And when she did do Lady Sings the Blues, I was enamored by it. And I wanted to go out and get the, the, um, the actual album, double album that they had out. <clears throat> and I couldn't find it. And I instead bought Lady in Satin by Billie Holiday. And it just fed into my, my blood, this, this, this album. And then I ended up buying Sarah Vaughan and buying Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington, da, 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 alongside groups like Black Ivory and the Stylistics and the Shy Lights and the Temptations and the Jacksons. It was such a great thing. And then um, there was groups like, what's it, what are they called again? Um, oh, God. Um, uh, the Love's Gonna Pack Up. I walk out on the pers- the persuaders, I think. Persuaders, yes. It's a thin line between love and hate. These are the times of, of songs, you know. <clears throat> Feels so. I, and and I was a kid, um, not even thirteen, fourteen, or something like that. But we, this is the kind of thing I was listening to. Laura Lee. Um, oh my Christ! It was it was so. Anyway, 
you, I want to say something to you. Our crowd has just gave us the name to Melba Moore's partner, Clifton Davis. Clifton Davis. See how great they are. That's the Michael Jackson version. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. My phone keeps clicking. I thought I took the sound out, but it's like... Uh, and it's very it's, insulting that they're, they're kind, trying to contact you. I know. They all want the attention. But what it, it was an ex for me, and it still is, you know, especially now in, 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 in the environment we're in, it's so inspiring to still get that injection of when you hear that that particular piece of music oh my god you know oh, i want to get down or you know you want to sing to it you know like a minute ago when i went downstairs and you heard me singing to um don't knock me love baby you know because it's just like wow it's, Can it's you imagine uh, people every time he opens his mouth it's like another song comes out it's like it's another... that's me i'm a crazy singing fool that's that's how i've always been like, like, what happens when we're all together he'll just come out yeah. and you're like we, no, you're always not. singing. I mean, you know, and even as a kid, um, I used to be on, when I came back to London, I used to have a, a Panasonic cassette machine. And you'd know me because I was the one echoing and singing and with the echo of the underground station with my, with my cassettes tape machine, you know, and cassettes and stuff like that. And um, so, at, you know, when I came back to London, <clears throat> it, there was a heavy, diverse, um, scene here you had the reggae clouds crowds with the of the sound systems which my cousins used to take me to so for a period i was into all this heavy do -do 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 and the heavy sound systems and uh, was it um bluesville in, in turnpike lane and then all of a sudden a friend of mine said look you know you need to come to this club bird's nest they're playing a lot of import soul and they'd have djs that came off the um army bases and they would be playing these import soul records and so um all of a sudden i started following that but i bounced from one to the next to the next until finally you know the soul gave in and the fun gave in but i still like my lover's rock and stuff but it was a scenario where you know we'd buy records we spend so much money on import records because you can they were not the the, the record labels weren't releasing um you know black music over here you know it would only and be why and why was that at that time they didn't feel that there was a marketplace for it you only get it like on a compilation album uh ktel thing and you know you get the the most popular ones like hughes corporation or maybe Gloria gain or something like that on these little compilation albums so you you know buy it. they had these super bad albums i remember um at a time you know but the heavier stuff you'd have to be paying 15, 20 pounds, you know, for, for these albums, you know. And a lot of the jazz fusion or, or, or I'd say musicians that, you know, that played on all the, everybody else's tracks started to create their own music. And that's when I think the, you know, the Wayne, Wayne Henderson's, Roy Ayers, all of that started to emerging. And, and obviously the disco kind of situation came in, but I wasn't really, into the disco thing. I was more into the, the whole funk, the whole jazz funk situation, because we were dancing all the time. We'd go to clubs to dance, you know, we'd walk in, we'd feel we're bad, you know, and we'd dress, you know, we'd all dress and bam, as soon as you get on there, bam, hit that floor. Dun, dun, dun. And it was all about that, you know. And at the same time, I was, um, I managed to start as acting um, and I started to, 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 to actually sing with a band. I was doing a, a musical, um, with this band and they asked me, you know, would I like to gig with them on the weekends? And that started it all up. And I started to gig and, and you know, then I was working part-time then gigging and, but it was fun. It's, it's amazing the amount of things I did then without a mobile, <laughs> without a fact. Right. There was no such yeah. thing as that. No, no yeah, beepers, no You had to fun. be there on time. You had to be there, otherwise they'd leave you. You know, it was, right. it was like that, you know, it was no mobiles. It was like, we're going to be a da 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 Otherwise, you take that taxi and the money that you're earning for the gig, that's what you're going to be paying your taxi. You know, so it was, and it was, it, it was still fun, but I was learning and I was believing, you, you, you know, even now it's, it's fun learning, the education of still learning, you know, stuff. Like I said earlier, you know, um, I got an opportunity to, to, to DJ for Solar Radio the other day and I'd done it a few times, but um, it's, it's another area. I thought, well, so, yeah. I've so when some... you think DJ, are you talking about being like a presenter DJ? 
No, DJing, actually playing. Like Basically, mixing? Like mixing yeah, 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 or, oh, yeah, or yeah. talking? DJing and talking. I mean, when Body Talk, our first single came out, I remember prior to that, a friend of mine in South London used to have parties and he used to call me Triple because obviously Lee, Triple E. So he used to say, Triple, get on the decks, get on the decks. You know, so I'd get on there and I'd start playing, you know, because he said, you know, the other guy wasn't any good. So he said, Triple, get on there. So he's, when Body Talk became a hit, he phoned me and he said to me, I don't care what's happening, what you're doing, but you're going to play my wed you're going to play my wedding and I'm going to work my schedule around your wedding. I'm thinking, no, I can't do a wedding. I've just done Top the Pops, you know, but I did. I did do his wedding and um, which was quite interesting in, in, in Peckham. Oh, even before we get to the wedding situation, where does this whole thing lead to imagination? Because there's a whole story to that. As oh, my well. gosh. So how does um, the imagination group begin and where does that where does that come together and how is that born? Well, basically, I, I, uh, I, I started to do a lot of different sessions. Um, and as I said, my, my, my main thing was to be the best, to learn. I, did, I was a singing waiter. I did sessions. And one of the sessions was with Trevor Horn, you know, Trevor Horn, the producer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he produced Grace Jones. He People Google Steve that. Horn. Trevor Horn, if you don't know, you're going to be very impressed when you <laughs> see impressed. He was his resume the really is the who's who of who. <laughs> he is. I mean, he def to me, he defines the one record that defines the 80s sound is Slave to the Rhythm to me, because technically it has all these different elements that made 80s music for me. And her album was this one song, Slave to the Rhythm. But prior to that, he was. Um, working in a group called Buggles. You know, they had a track called um, Video Kill the Radio Star. But before he even did that, um, he was producing and doing all these different stuff. Anyway, I was with the management and uh, we did a few songs together. And uh, one of these songs was called Got To Be Good. And um, which I found the other day, it's, it's like on an acetate, but it wasn't mixed properly. And I went for some reason to um, a company which was distributed by Pi or PRT in London. And the A&R guy was a crazy guy called Morgan Kahn, who um, later on became quite successful with the Street Sounds label. Any of you guys who know the Street Sounds label? All oh, no Street Sounds. I always yeah. putting them up. Street exactly. Sounds. Exactly, Street Sounds label. So Morgan was like, hey, man, you know, I like what you're doing with this track, but we got to do this to it and da-da-da-da, baby, 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 baby. And I thought, you know, this guy's out of his mind, you know. But I like the energy. And um, anyway, we uh, managed to get the master. We had to go through all this technical thing to, to buy, get the track and blah, 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 blah. Uh, cut long story short, he wanted to sign me. He said, you know, like, I'm going to sign you. Um, and, uh, and that was it, you know. PR records? It was, it was, he actually formed the label for me, which was R&B. Okay. He formed that label for me because it was the first. So it was, it was, they had Red Bus, but he wanted to call it R&B. So he formed it for me, but they lost the master. They sent it to America. I think they wanted to get EWF horns and bra or whatever it was on it. And they lost it. They lost the master tape. The multi-track. The multi-track multi tape, right? Yeah. One of these, I've got a tape thing here, but it's a thicker one. Have I got one here? Uh, it's something a bit like this, <laughs> but a lot thicker. Yeah, this two, inch a, tape. two inch tape. Two inch tape. This is a quarter inch tape. Oh my God, you would not believe what's on this quarter inch tape. Just, uh, just going ahead a bit. I've just found I've got to put my glasses on for this, but you guys are going to be shocked. This is a quarter inch tape of a mastering mix of, th of two tracks, and they are... One is The Last Time, which was from our um, Closer album. And the other one is Instinctual. See if you can see Ooh. that. See? Instinctual. That? Look wow. at that, everyone. Wow. I mean, that's, that's going back to the, God, this was not, what was it? What year was this? Oh, this says the 16th of the 3rd, March 1988. 16th. March 16th, everyone, 1988. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine? So those were the... Those are the days. So there's, uh, um, and, and actually, in fact, we're going to be doing a, a, a special box set of imagination. And we'll get to that later. Don't get off. Don't get off. Don't get off. Oh, yeah, well, Stay we'll on get, the train because you're going to jump yeah. off. So, so yeah. R&B Records is created. Yes, yes, yes. It's got to be good. Wait, which multi-track is missing now? 
Got to be good. Got to be good. It's a track called Got to be good. Okay. It's got to be good. And, um, and so basically, um, who was, it? oh yeah, the record company, uh, no, it's Tony, uh, uh, Morgan Khan and Ellis Elias, who was one of the directors came to me and said, look, Lee, we're very sorry. Um, but you know, look, I think you can write, you know, great songs and stuff. Maybe you could write something with one of our producers. I, at this point, I was like kind of really pissed off and I thought, you know. So anyhow, a cutting story short, Tony Swain gave me, um, who's one of my producers, a, a cassette. And, um, you know, he, he, I remember him distinctly because he's a lovely guy. And he basically said, look, anything you want to do, you may not like it, you may like it, da 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 And, and Tony's the same today. He's exactly the same today. He's like, you know, he's like a... a a biscuits and tea kind of guy. He's really great. And we, we're very, still very, very tight all these years, all these decades later, I should say. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's more like decades now. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and, and funnily enough, when we get together and we have got together to write certain things, it's funny how I will still fall back into that sound with him. You know, I'll sing in, 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 in evoke certain situations because of chords or even, even how I interpret things. But that's another thing. But um, anyway, cut long story short, I went home and I even say this in my shows because I'm very, very proud of it. You know, one song can determine your whole destiny and it can change your life. And one of my things was I prayed that I could write one classic record that the whole world could be listening to. And if that could happen, I'd be happy and that would be it, you know. Of course, it became a lot more than that. But I wrote the lyrics and the melody to Body Talk. And at that time, I was gigging in about two or three different bands, one band called Fizz um, with Ashley. And I, I used to bring Ashley, my bass player, to all these different things. We were gigging in all. I was like a gig crazy person. I was gigging in Brixton at the George Canning Pub, which had, you know, had a great time down there. Um, and it was about the work and doing it. And I was doing sometimes a Saturday morning job. Sometimes I was doing a full-time job and in the evening gigging as well. And I thought nothing of it, you know, nowadays you get out of breath, but then, yeah. you know, it was like, yeah. And, and a lot of people were doing that. They were working and working in the nights, getting in the morning. And, and, and then on Saturday they, they'd gig and then go to a rave, you know, <laughs> it was, it was part of the, 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 the that's what it was about. And, and then I was still creating, I was still writing and stuff. And um, anyway, um, I asked Morgan and Tony for studio time and said, look, I've got a track, got to go in, boom, boom. So I went in and I called Ashley and I said, look, da, 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 I've got this idea. So we were thinking very much, and at that time, one of my favorite albums was Stay Free by Ashley and Simpson, who I love to death. I think they're, they are one of the, the best writers you know in the in the, in the industry oh, without a doubt it's probably one that yeah. it's not the best out there yeah, my favorite track um nobody knows the inside you know oh gosh you know i had an event a couple um about two years ago and on actually basically on youtube where everyone all my friends everybody we're all dancing to nobody knows we're doing some line dancing and stuff it's it's amazing everyone's getting down to it but anyway ashton simpson uh, were very influential in 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 because um, they had that kind of gospel feel along with soul and they had the pop aesthetic as well. So with Body Talk, um, we rehearsed, 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 rehearsed. I remember rehearsing it, oh. and uh, Tony kept saying, you know, like, why don't you record what you're doing? Because we're in the studio by this time. But the Body uh, Talk, when you did it, were you at home on a piano, like working out chords, or you just wrote the lyric? I just wrote the lyric and the melody, melody of the cassette. The cassette was 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 minimal to what we that, that we had in the studio. So um, it was interesting how I weaved and dived and created. I created my own chords through the melody. So I mean, they didn't know what I was going to do in the studio. To be quite honest, so they were sitting literally sitting back, and that was it. Wait, so I had, I'm waiting yeah, to see what you like. Yeah, Morgan and Tony just sat there, you know, like, okay, well, what are you going to do? And Morgan was going crazy. He used to rub his head and go, oh my God, why wow, this is so sexy? And, you know, like, body talk is a very sexy song. And um, 
the only change we did was, I believe, was Ashley was singing high like me, but it wasn't, the, it didn't, the timbrance wasn't right. But what you hear on Body Talk is one take, and then we just overdubbed with the um, choruses and stuff. And um, so then he cut it on an acetate, which is like, um, before you do an actual vinyl, you do an acetate, which is like to test it, to see whether or not, you know, the, the record sounds cool. And then he did white labels. And at that time in the UK, if you had a record that was a white label coming from America or supposedly coming from America, all the DJs would be grabbing it. <clears throat> and Body Talk was one of the slowest records of that year because it was the, the tempo and the hypnotic sense of it. And, and uh, it had jazz, it has a reggae feel, it had all these different elements and it was resounding. And, you know, and the, and the 12 inch version, everyone was playing. And um, in actual fact, it's one of the longest records in the chart that year. So um, what happened was the record company said, well, what are you going to do? You know, wh what are you going to go out as, uh, you know, what's it going to be? And I didn't, even though we'd had Body Talk and, you know, we hadn't charted yet. It was just going out into clubs. I didn't trust the record company. So I said to them, you know what, I'm going to form a group. Because, but wait a minute, how did you know not to trust them? What Was it a gut feeling? Or did someone clue you up? Well, no, because they lost my, they lost got oh, to Oh, because of the multi-track. They're already Yeah, they lost they're my, they already, they already they had got. one strike against them. You know, they lost my bloody track. So, you know, I'm thinking, I don't trust these people. I don't care what they say. So I thought, I'm going to form a group so they can't screw up my solo career. You know? <laughs> so that's what happened. I then decided, you know, look, get Ashley in. Later on, we got Errol in. And that's how it happened. You know, it was one of those scenarios. But... I was very involved uh, in the in the nucleus of you know what imagination was. Everybody did their bit, you know, especially on the live side. But you know, Ashley and Errol were uh, are great musicians, and what they did and what they contributed. Um, when it came to the studio side, I was very much a part of you know all the songs. You know, were an embodiment of what was was in my mind, or when I was with Steve Jolly, who was the other co-producer. Um, but I had a wide berth. You know, it wasn't, we weren't conditioned to like, this is how we do it, da, da, da. Um, you know, I remember on the okay. first album. Hang on, yeah. hang on. So here's the most important thing as a producer myself. And mm -hmm. who was the first person? Yes. Who was the first person that played Body Talk to blow that record up? Because you know, it's always the first person where you get the call. Guess what? Such and such played the record. No way. You know, like a BBC person. Who it was it? it was. Tell us everyone. Who was it? What oh my happened? Gosh, I'm gonna die. Oh my lord. It was Did not you not forget Pete that? Young. I think it's Pete Young. Okay. I think it was Pete Young. I think it was Pete Young. I think it was on Capitol. Right. Um, I think on Capitol Radio at the time. I think he played it. Um, I think Robbie Vincent played it. Greg Edwards played it. By wow, the only um, in the skies, all the aliens. The one person that was really, really behind it was some um, who we helped with the name was Steve Walsh. Steve Walsh was one of the biggest DJs at the time. And he helped, he was always at, at R &B, um, and b And to the point where when we were creating the name Imagination, he was involved in, you know, maybe you should call it this, da 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 da, you know, so he was in there. And oh, he, he was, was in that, he was in the meeting with that too? Oh, yeah, he was there, Steve Walsh. Hey, nobody yeah. knows that stuff. I never read, yeah, read that was, before. Oh, yeah, he was behind us all the time he was really really behind he puts in actual fact he presented us at shows um and, and how did they present you when they present when they used to introduce you because you're a new band mm. they say something like hits hit making star or something like that oh my lord you know what it's it's we were so crazy you know because we had these you know we had the wild costumes you know we we, we kind of took from the theatre, we took from the club scene, because the club scene was wild. You know, people went out to clubs and they, everybody dressed. It was post-punk, new wave. So you can imagine, well, in New York, they, you know, they did it. What the kids are doing now, we were doing, you know, 40 years ago, you know, 30 right. years ago. And, but it was like, you know, especially for a black group, my God, what are they doing? Wow, wow. But, you know, groups like Funkadelic and Parliament were doing that kind of thing. When we saw that show, we thought, yeah, we've got to take a bit of that, you know, and, and, and really push it. Um, there was a lot of thought, you know, it wasn't just put together just like that. There was a lot of thought as to what we were doing, especially when we went on to TV, because you only get three minutes and you have to make that three minutes count. 
Right. And then, and with Morgan, he was very, very crafty. He said, look, you've got three minutes. People are going to watch you. Tomorrow I want everybody talking about you guys. You know, that was what was in his mind. So he put a, and he put a lot of weight on my shoulders, you know, saying, oh my God. Because I remember when we did Top of the Pops, um, and, and one of the things people don't know, some people do know, was that a, a group dropped out at the last minute. And that's how we got onto Top of the Pops. Otherwise, you may never have heard of us. And that's the, that was, that's the truth. That's how we got onto TV. And um, our performance was so explosive that everyone was talking about us. The next day was in newspapers and da, da, da. it went on and on and on and on. And this a little something that people don't know is I had done an acting role for a TV detective show called The Chinese Detective. And I think Top of the Pops was on a Thursday. And the next day I was in The Chinese Detective. And a lot of people don't know that. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I was acting and I've done quite a few little acting. I did, I did, there was a uh, thing on Nelson Mandela, which uh, I'd done in 81. And I was in this courtroom thing in that as well. And uh, but I never said anything to anyone. It's just like, now I can talk about it. But yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, you have got, got, got to try and find it on YouTube, you know, but... Uh, and, Everyone look for the uh, Chinese detective with Lee John. See if you could yeah, I mean, I've got, I got a boom box with it, which is so funny. And yeah, it, it was funny because it was at that time, um, we were we were always working people. It was about the work, you know, and oh, you were inspired cool. by the work. Hey, hang on. Because we have also younger people now that never had a chance to see the BBC Top of the Pops. Can you, in a brief explanation, how important was that show to pop music and what was consistent of that show? Because some people don't know that, you know? Top of the Pops is on BBC every Thursday night. It was um, a show that the whole family, which we don't do nowadays, you know, the whole family sat down together, they had their dinner, you know, mom, dad, sister, brother, and everybody would be watching this musical program. And on this program, the music was very diverse and it had popular music. It sometimes, if you're lucky, they had a reggae record on there. And, you know, they had different groups, you know, from America, all over the place. But what it did do, it brought us all together and it, in, it had very high ratings because everybody would run home to watch Top of the Pops to see who was going to be on. Or you'd look on the listing and say, oh, Imagination's on, oh, I'm going to run, you know, so it was that kind of program. And it was very, very important because um, everyone was together. The family was together, you know what I'm saying? And um, which you don't get a lot of that today, you know? Oh, you don't, you don't. You know, because everybody's in their own rooms or they're watching on their own mobiles and stuff like that. Yeah, There's exactly. a unity and a togetherness yes. that I think that was really cool. Because like, I'd sit with my mom, my sister, we'd be all there watching. And even if I didn't like the group, you know, we'd slag the group off, whatever, there'd be something else coming on. That's, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. Especially if it was a black group, we're all <laughs> we were thinking. And the scenario was for me, I used to count how many black groups from the UK would be on TV because this situation. And, and what I used to think, especially when Body Talk came out, what was in my mind, I thought, oh, it's only going to go top 30, top 40, and then that would be it. Because that was the support that the, the, the industry had behind British black artists. They didn't push them. They didn't, they didn't you know, it was, it was the Americans. And you were like, you know, we, the Americans were A and we were C, you know, or D. And that was how that's meant. And I, and I fought that very, very hard. I thought it very hard. I thought, we want A, we want A, we've got to go for A. And so each time we went on top of the pops, you know, we became more out, you know, going and, you know, we pushed, because we were a live group. I came from the live background. So we took that to such a level, right? We have to get a live show out there and show people what we're about, that we right. can be this super group. Um, eventually, you know, we toured all over the world and uh, we're known for a, our, our shows and stuff like that. So, you know, but it was a lot of hard work. And I remember we, from as much as we promoted here, we promoted in Europe just as much. France became like a huge territory for me, e even right now, you know, very, very huge. Yeah, I know. They um, love you there. They always mention yeah. you. Every time I went every day, they play John, you have Lee John music. Yes, I have the John's music. I have it. Yes, I have it. Yes, I they have. have. They buy everything. They buy my jazz album. They buy every. And France is the Benelux territories. It's Africa. It's South America. Um, even with the Gorillas uh, um, track I did, I didn't realize how many South American fans that you know I have, and also Imagination Music has and stuff, um, because they all came out of the woodwork. You know, from Argentina and. 
Brazil and stuff like that. And, and that's why, even though we're in such a pandemic, how music can bring us together, how it can really generate some goodness and positivity, some upliftment. And I'm glad that I can be a vessel that can actually help bring that through. Because believe me, going from day to day to day to day, you need something, you know. Right. I, to hold on. Like, yeah, that's why I put my tie on for you today. <laughs> Real professionally, I'd say he's so so, 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 so we got the body talk, okay? When does I'm proud of that. I'm very proud. You of should that. be, damn you. You should be, I'm and very, very proud. proud. But let's be real. America comes knocking at the door. When does that happen? Well, America. That's a big thing for old English is to break that America. I know to break the American market. I mean. And, you know, we were like, oh, my God, we're going to go to America. And the call came and it was not what he taught. What he taught. America is divided into so many different states that, you know, what he taught was hitting in Nevada or something like that. Or that's uh, 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 the West Coast. Yeah. Yeah. No, West Coast. Yeah. But it was in the West Coast. But in New York and Philadelphia and Chicago, Detroit, it was so good, so right and burning up. That's right. They were the ones, it was a double A side. And all of a sudden, we got a request from Larry Levan, Paradise Garage. And one of my favorite clubs was the one in New Jersey. Zanzibar. Zanzibar. I love Zanzibar. Zanzibar was, re I mean, you know, I love Zanzibar. Zanzibar, they made you feel at home. They really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Zanzibar was... They gave me, I remember they gave me this Eddie Kendricks mix of Gurney and the Change of Mind, and I left it there because we were, we were enjoying ourselves. We were partying so much, it, well, I forgot it there. But they looked after you, the point where they'd have this jacuzzi and, and, and steam thing, and they really looked, but they were really great people. It wasn't the same as in New York where, you know, hey, they're so used to everybody. But in, in Zanzibar, I had a great time. And, and I love going, going back there every time to do shows there. <clears throat> and um, I think ten, not ten. What were they called again? Um, they got signed to Motown. Um, they were based there. One of the DJs, this group. Um, they you were like. To, who, you remember in in? You mean the DJ Timmy? Yeah. Reg Timmy registered and he was, was yeah. Was that Motown? I remember he was working there. Yeah, and there was a group. Remember they did one album. They were Blaze. huge. Who Blaze? Blaze, Blaze, my group, Blaze. Yes, that's Kevin Hedge and uh, Josh Milan, everyone. Look Blaze. Kevin Hedge and Josh Milan, they had an album. Blaze. Yes. But wait, Blaze. so wait, let's go back to Larry Levan in the Paradise Garage, because this I know there's a story that's good that has, because I asked you this uh, decades ago. Who calls who and what happens to make this all come to America thing? You know, who's calling oh. to bring you? Um, oh my goodness gracious now, you, you get me the thing now. I mean, Larry, you think, wanted us there and we, we went there more than once. I kind of remember the second time more, but the first oh. time we went, I remember the first time we went, everybody said, don't do, they don't do alcohol and don't drink any of the punch. <laughs> so I remember they said, don't drink anything, bring water. And that's because we were doing, you know, those times you 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 you, got, you go on stage at one o'clock in the night or two o'clock then they send you to zanzibar at three o'clock something like that 